right group of people. Alrighty, welcome along once again, folks. I hope you enjoy the evening and that you are kind to each other. <laughs> we have candidates uh, tonight here from um, two electorates of Ken in Hamilton. You have seen on the advertising for tonight that uh, Nania Mahuta and Rahui Papa were also going to be present as candidates for the Māori seat for Hauraki Waikato. Uh, they were always only going to be present for a brief time as there is a televised debate on the Māori channel being filmed at Waikato University tonight. Unfortunately, the timing of this debate has been brought forward and, and a few days ago they had to advise that they could no longer participate. So apologies from them. So from the Hamilton West electorate, we have the Honourable Tim McIndoe, the sitting MP uh, for the National Party. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Gaurav Sharma from the Labour Party. Joe Ridley from the Green Party. Shane Wihongi from the New Zealand First. Party. Quentin Todd, United Future. And Donna Polkari Phillip from the Other Party. Thank you. And from the Hamilton East, we have apologies from the Honourable David Bennett. Uh, as you know, as a sitting MP, he had a, another function in Auckland that he just could not um, excuse himself from, so he apologises for not being here today, and of course, as you know, he has a ministerial portfolio. Uh, Jamie Strange from the Labour Party. <laughs> Sam Taylor from the Green Party. And Peter Paroni from the New Zealand First Party. All right, to start the ball rolling, uh, we're inviting each of the political parties to make an opening statement. Where there are more than one candidate, which is the case for most, um, from the same party, they can select one of them to speak on their behalf. And in some cases, they're going to uh, do it together, a tag talk. Uh, and they have two minutes. Uh, as explained before, when they get to one minute and 50 seconds, music will start to play. Um, so to be fair about the order, I'm going to randomly select a party name from the hat, which is here. Here it is. So I know you're already worried about who's going to be first. In about one second, it's going to be decided. It is going to be Donna. And you can speak from here. Yes, yep, nothing there. Thanks, Donna. My name is Donna Pukiri Phillips and I've been living in Hamilton West for about 20 years now. I'm, I'm a Taranaki girl and I met a Kaimu boy and he's the reason why I've moved up these ways <laughs> <laughs> to the beautiful Waikato. The reason why I joined uh, the Opportunities Party uh, was two points. One was because um, I was really, really concerned about our community. Now I live in Hamilton West and I know my community intimately and, so poverty, homelessness, high youth suicide is a major issue within my community um, and, and within in Aotearoa itself. So that was one of the reasons and the other reason was the degradation of our environment and I was really concerned about waterways, uh, um, about pollution going into our waterways. Those are really important keys. Now I was following Gareth Morgan and some of you might know him as the cat man and that's okay. Uh, um, I was following him before he was a politician or decided to set up the Opportunities Party and I was quite impressed with his philanthropic um, ideas and I did follow him when he journeyed around the world doing some of his amazing charitable work. And then when he set up the Opportunities Party I thought, wow, this is interesting. And I started following some of his policies and I can say hand on heart there is not one policy that I do not support. Now, that's a rarity for me, because those that know me know that I'm pretty radical and I'm hard to please. Well, I've met my match with Gareth Morgan. He's pretty radical, and his philosophy is, you're rather radical now than extreme later, and I totally support that. So I hope we have a good night. We actually do know each other's policies by now, because we've been on the campaign trail by, uh, for a while. And uh, I can say, I look forward to tonight. It's been a real privilege. Kia ora. Thank you very much. 
Next is the Labour Party. Jamie first, by the look of it, or... I was hoping Dolan was going to start singing along with the music came out. <laughs> um, good, good evening, everyone. I'm Jamie Strange, and this is Dr. Guru Sharma, so uh, we're going to tag team it. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our MPs and candidates, our adjudicator, and everyone for being here tonight, so thank you very much. So, um, from a personal point of view, um, I, I work as a school teacher. I used to be a church minister uh, with the Elam Church over in Tauranga for five years. My wife and I attend Gateway Church. We've got four children, uh, married for 20, 20 years, even though I look about 20 out there, <laughs> I am 41. Um, the the um, key reason I'm with Labour is particularly around education. I think education is absolutely vital for our society, and adding to that the trades and apprenticeships. It creates opportunity for people um, to get ahead. Uh, the other key area is for Labour around housing. Um, we think housing is actually the number one issue in this election. I'm sure it will come out as, as the questions, questions come out. Another one is around health. It's important that we have a good public health system that's there for people that's accessible. And another key issue for us is around community safety. We've said we'll have a thousand police to the force and, and we'll bring back the community policing model. A number of our community stations have been closed now as the police have been centralised down the southern end of Victoria Street. So those are just some of our, our um, key platforms. And uh, I'll hand over to Gaurav to introduce himself. Uh, kia ora everyone, I am Soraya Mani Ridley. I'm just coming from Auckland where I was attending another event, but it wasn't with David Banta. First of all, thank you for having me here. I'm um, just going to give a quick introduction about myself because I've been one of the uh, last people to be selected in New Zealand in the electorate. Uh, so I'm Gaurav, I grew up in, in Auckland for a large part of my life. I went to Auckland Medical School. I did part of my training in Waikato Hospital. Uh, when I was 19, I helped write a couple of health policies for New Zealand uh, and was nominated for the New Zealand of the Year Award. Uh, I've done some public health work in Switzerland, Spain, Vietnam, Philippines, Mongolia. Uh, and more recently, I was a Fulbright squad in Washington, D.C., where I was studying business, politics, and public health. I'm really passionate about healthcare, and that's. I think we've got yeah, passionate about healthcare. Kind of makes sense, uh, Doctor. Yeah, very good. Okay, next one. Uh, national. Kira Toto, good evening. My name is Tim McIndoe. For the last nine years, I've had the privilege of being the MP for Hamilton West, and I am again the National Party candidate for the electorate. Could I say to those of you who are here from Hamilton West, thank you for the great privilege of representing you. Whether you've supported me in the past or not, I have hugely enjoyed and appreciated the honour, and I believe that we have delivered many things that the electorate has benefited from, as indeed the country has from our policies. Could I also thank Brian, John and Alan for their initiative in organising this meeting, and all of you for coming out on such a horrible night. Your participation here is hugely encouraging to us as candidates, because there have been a few of these events where the candidates almost outnumber the audience. <laughs> Could I also thank the candidates, because up until now, it has been a very decent campaign. We've had spirited debate about the issues, but I can assure you, I think everybody up here is a good person with the right heart. It's my hope that you will re-elect me and, more importantly, give your party vote to the National Party so that we can continue to deliver the sort of policies that I think are making a real difference for the good in our country. When we came into office, we were told by Treasury that the country faced at least a decade of deficits, probably even longer than that. Now, no household could survive in that sort of state, and nor can a country. We said, no, we've got to do better than that. And in the last few years, we have not only turned the country back into surpluses, you are now seeing how we can invest in things that really make a difference in the lives of New Zealanders. And I am particularly passionate and committed about ensuring that we continue to help those who are struggling in our communities, because there are many. And it is the vulnerable who most need our help, and they are the ones who I am most concerned to ensure we do things to lift them up. Everybody deserves a fair go from the government. Everybody deserves to be able to keep as much of the money that they earn from their hard work as possible. But I ask you for your support and enjoy the <laughs> to do a little bit of a jig up here, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of, that's what I'm using, isn't it? The Greens, the Greens are next, I think you're going to take all. Kia ora koutou, my name's Jo Wrigley and I'm the uh, candidate for Hamilton West, Green Party. Um, our campaign priorities, 
uh, poverty, climate and water. But tonight what I want to do is acknowledge that today is World Suicide Prevention Day. Aroha nui to all those who have felt the heartbreaking loss of suicide in their family, friends and communities. We want to acknowledge the failures of the mental health system, but we also want to acknowledge the hardworking medical staff, nurses, caregivers, and support people who are trying their hardest every day. Hang in there, change is coming. Uh, kia ora, my name is Sam, I'm the Green Party candidate for Hamilton East in this election, and can I just say, tonight, so far, I know we've just started, but it's the funnest candidate debate that I've been in, so thank you all very much. <laughs> Um, so I think that there's one question that is really important for us to all answer for ourselves tonight, and that is, what is the purpose of government if not to respond to the challenges of our time? And Jo has highlighted one of those challenges in terms of our mental health. There are two others that I'd like to discuss with you. One is poverty. The UNICEF report recently outlined that we have 295,000 children in this country living in poverty. And I suggest that that is, that is a, a moral and a political failure on all of our parts. In a country as... Uh, affluent and rich in opportunity is New Zealand, it should not be the case. Uh, the other challenge is climate change, and it's been suggested that this generation is the first generation that can end poverty, and the last generation that can end climate change. This is our last chance to seriously get this right, and this election really matters for that reason, because there are a series of political decisions and consequences um, that will occur as the result of who we choose to elect. So I would love to talk to you more about our climate policy, but the music's starting! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, my name is Quentin. Um, I've been living in Hamilton since 1985, minus two years. Um, the last few years I've been recovering from a whole illness, but it's given me the opportunity to explore um, different aspects of what's been happening in the world. I'd like to, to, for us to spare a minute and a thought and a prayer for those who are struggling through um, Cyclone Irma in Florida at the moment. Um, I hit Cuba yesterday at about 300 kilometres an hour, so I can't imagine having to struggle with that. So I just thought it. <clears throat> we live in a world of numbers and statistics, but we must ask what will the impact of this policy or that policy be for New Zealanders in 20 years' time? United Future announced recently that we are going to be, if we're going to be part of the next government, we would require all ministry policy regulations and legislation to make a 20-year impact test. <clears throat> Being Rickard has spokesman for the future generation said, and I quote, for decades government policy has been focused on short-term fixes with thinking that extends only as far as the next election cycle. This means shoring up problems for our future generations to deal with and we don't think that's quite right, unquote. As a party, we want to see established a commission for future generations. And I believe this is a great idea. We need to be able to think carefully, creatively and compassionately about, about and planning our future for our children, for our country. What's more, we must think carefully, creatively and compassionately or think more globally. Wow, you've got a few bits of paper there. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, of course, uh, New Zealand first. So, Shane. Thanks. Uh, good evening, everybody. Tēnā Koto. I guess at this point I should say, this is the moment, Pito, where they say the best for last day. <laughs> <laughs> got to give that a whirl. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Pito and I are here from New Zealand first. And uh, you can take where our, our drive, our direction comes from by the name of our party. That is putting New Zealand and New Zealanders first. That means putting regional New Zealand first. That means putting working New Zealand first. That means putting uh, youth New Zealand first. And by looking at Pitta and I, 
Yes, even putting Māori New Zealand first. Uh, we had come across this campaign and been out there uh, for these last few weeks, out in the community talking to you and trying to understand what you feel the issues of this campaign are. It is very easy for us to come before you and say, here's what we think the issues of the campaign are. But it is a little bit harder to go out there amongst you, talk to you in front of your homes and in your streets, and let you tell us what this election is about for you and what is important to you. So in saying that we are here from New Zealand first, we hope that over the remaining two or so weeks, a little bit less, that this campaign will run, even though voting starts tomorrow, um, that we will have the opportunity to let you know why we think we are in the position to put New Zealand and New Zealanders first for each and every one of you. And I'm going to finish before the music starts. So <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. Look forward to the conversation. Well, thank you very much. You all did really very well. Of course, the big challenge comes now when you only have one minute to answer deep and profound questions that uh, have been uh, previously uh, circulated to churches. We've received some good feedback and some of the congregation from this church. We put it all together and we've worked on some questions. We've let you know uh, so that you can um, give us uh, some very thoughtful, deep and profound answers. So we're looking forward to that in one minute. So, uh, the first question is, why do you think New Zealand's mental health statistics, particularly our suicide stats, uh, are among the highest in the world for youth suicide, for we've been commenting on, are as bad as they are? What are your party's plans to address uh, this major national concern? Now, you can just speak in any order at this point. So. Thank you. I'll answer that question for, for New Zealand first. We think that the uh, problem is that we have a lack of skilled uh, workforce. Um, there's a lack of, uh, of knowledge in terms of where uh, funding needs to be allocated and so we support the notion of a, uh, a review of the whole uh, mental health system. I'm just wondering, I haven't actually received the questions previously, so if there is a copy of them, I'd be grateful. Uh, as far as mental health is concerned, I think it's a multifaceted issue, and there are a number of things that are clearly causing us huge problems in our community. A lack of hope is clearly part of it for some people. I think addictions, thank you very much, Brian. I think addictions of various types contribute to it. Uh, the breakdown of traditional family units and uh, dysfunctional upbringings for many people. So as I say, there are a number of different things that I think contribute to it. We as a government are firmly committed to doing what we can to empower agencies and fund those programs that can make a difference. In this year's budget, we confirmed an extra $224 million over four years for mental health and addiction services. We've introduced things that we hope will make a difference for young people who are obviously quite technologically literate. There's a four-digit number that they can contact now 24-7 to ensure that there is somebody on the end of the phone who they can reach out to. There's more to, to be done with it, and it's certainly something we need to tackle. Yeah, so just uh, before the next person speaks, thanks, Tom. Uh, could the um, number come up for the uh, text question? So don't forget, you're free to text any time now. Uh, and, uh, as earlier uh, mentioned, we'll then uh, collate those and every now and again I'll interject with a question from the floor. Okay, we're still on this first question. If um, anybody else would like to respond? No, not in order. You just can be out of order just as, as it comes, just as, as quick as possible. That would be, be great. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, I guess the first thing is there is a problem with healthcare overall in New Zealand at the moment. We've had um, a $2 billion deficit in, in investment in our healthcare. The population has been on the rise, whether it's immigration or it's just you know organic. Uh, but at the end of the day, we haven't been investing in our healthcare, number one. Number two is mental health always suffers when there is a deficit in healthcare because you know people never see mental health as equivalent to having physical health problems. 
You can have a tumor, you can have a cancer, you can break your leg. It's easy for the doctor to diagnose you and you, know, you can go on your way and get, get a treatment for it. But when you've got mental health issues, you know, it's very hard to first of all reach out, get access to healthcare. Second thing is get diagnosis and third thing is get treatment. So mental health always suffers. Uh, so that's because you know healthcare overall is suffering. Uh, and then third thing is uh, obviously you know youth suicide rates are one of the highest in the world. Uh, and what we're saying at Labour is that we're going to invest in having mental health nurses in every school in the country so that our kids can uh, access uh, mental health services. Thank you. Everyone, um, this is a topic that's really close to my heart as I've lost two immediate um, members of my family to suicide. And another reason uh, why I joined the Opportunities Party is because of their tax reform. So poverty is a, a, a driver of um, mental unwellness. So our tax reform will be looking at um, reducing our taxes by 30%. And 80% of us will benefit from us from, from those tax reforms. 20%, which are the wealthier ones, such as Gareth, will actually be paying a bit more um, taxes. Most of us pay between 24 and 30% of taxes. The likes of Gareth, Gareth and his uh, rich mates are only paying 10% or less. Um, also, the criminal justice system. So we want to legalise uh, cannabis and start dealing with some of the issues uh, uh, that are causing mental health. Uh, problems through addiction and also got that good fast. <laughs> I'll pass it on. So the Greens believe that mental health is a massively important single aspect of our health as individuals, families and communities. It intersects with income, homes, physical health, addiction, intergenerational violence and trauma, isolation and access to education and support. We need to address all of these things. Mental health providers are under-resourced and the wait lists are the obvious indicators of this. We need to increase the funding and include community-based social services that are best placed to work directly with individuals and their supporters in the short term. This must include support for families who are caring for dependents experiencing mental illness. Our goal is to have a mental health service that can respond to a call for help, instigate support without a wait list. When someone in need reaches out, we must clasp their hand and support their next steps. To achieve this, the Greens support the request from families that there is an independent review and inquiry into the provision of mental health. Thank you. Um, I had the unfortunate... Uh, uh, Queen, yeah. just hold the mic. Hold the mic. Sorry. Yeah. I um, had to attend a funeral of a young girl who committed suicide. Um, about four weeks ago, it was a uh, friend of mine's business partner's daughter, and she was in her mid 20s. Um, she'd suffered from depression. They didn't see the, some of the things that she was going through, um, and she made that choice to commit, herself, to commit suicide on her own. Um, so, while I agree with a lot of policies to help, um, I think it's going to have to come back to families and communities to try and say, put your, or try and put your hand up and say, well, can I help? And that's the start. Um, and in terms of medication, that might work, but in the long run, I think it's, it's, it's people like all say, if you, look, if you find somebody who's not looking right, just say, can I help? So while we're on the subject of uh, health, there is a question that's just coming from um, the audience, um, and I, I think we'll just, yeah, we'll just a very quick response, way less than a minute if possible to this question. Um, do your, you or your party support the development of the Waikato Medical School? Being quite controversial. Um, so um, I guess, Doctor, you want to say something about this? <laughs> this, is, this is the number one question I get asked everywhere. So I guess I'll quickly say, so I trained at Auckland Medical School, but I was in my career as well, so I do have a good view of this. I think in principle it's a great, great idea, because especially we're catering to the rural population, 
Uh, so it's a great idea, the rural GPs agree with it, the GP college agrees with it, I agree with it. I think what's left to be seen is the actual practicalities of it. Uh, last time I was involved in doubling the number of medical students in the country, we ended up with 60 students who didn't end up having a job at the end of their graduation. So we need to make sure that these people are integrated into the job force if we were to go ahead with it. So I think it's a great idea. Uh, it helps the economy, it helps Hamilton, but we just need right. to be able to look at it in detail. Uh, I haven't seen the full plan from either side. Uh, I've just received sort of half censored okay. reports, but it's a great idea. Okay, so let me just ask anybody who doesn't think it's a great idea and for what reasons, rather than have a, a re repetition, I guess, of uh, a similar response. Um, it's not that I don't support it. I don't know if there's enough uh, um, research whether or not we need it or not. Um, what I can say is the Opportunity Party um, supports regionalising um, uh, uh, support. So they want uh, um, to actually allow the communities to make up their mind what they need in their communities. I just know around 2013 there were a lot of graduates um, from medical school who actually couldn't find jobs and ended up going overseas. So maybe more to the point is do we encourage them to do that? So, yeah. Okay. All right, so that's um, next. Pick up on that, please. This is something that has been very well researched. There is an extremely good business case. It's based on a model that is already working extremely well in Ontario, Canada, and also in several parts of Australia. We have a critical shortage already of doctors, particularly in rural, provincial, hard to staff areas, and that shortage will only get more acute in the years to come. This is something that will be hugely beneficial to us here in Hamilton and the Waikato region from an investment perspective, but as far as meeting a need, it is a no-brainer, and I am 100% behind it. Good, thank you. And finally, the notion of improving access uh, for rural areas. We need to be satisfied that there is a, a, bus a business case, but more importantly, and people seem to tend to forget that medical students, when they enter uh, medical school, they tend to focus on becoming surgeons and not too much emphasis on, on uh, GPs. So that has to be considered as well. Thank you. So we're going to go on to our next prepared question. Um, so, you know, as Christians, uh, we have some very strong views and strong commitments to the notion of the family and largely the traditional understanding of the family, um, which I'm sure doesn't need to be defined. Um, however, over the years, the, that definition for family has been shifting. So this is a question around this. How would you define the concept of family and its importance for a robust uh, civil society? And then, as a tag, how best can central government undergird families? All yours. Hey. Stun us with your brilliance. <laughs> Here we go. Um, <clears throat> yeah, look, um, I, I think that when you look at a family unit, um, there are our children involved particularly, and it's um, and it's the well-being of the next generation coming through that's absolutely vital. I can see it as a school teacher. I can quite quickly look out on a, on, on a group of children and I can tell who has a positive, supportive home environment. And those who do tend to do well in terms of education and those who don't tend to struggle. It's, it, unfortunately, it's, it's just the way it is. Um, so in, in terms of Labour's view around supporting, supporting families, um, Health is one key area where we were going to bring in $8 GP visits for those with community services cards and also $32 for those without community services card. And another key one is around housing. Um, those who are renting, uh, having warm, dry houses and housing affordability too. So. Thank you. Yeah, get it. Um, I actually really enjoyed this question because I got to reflect on my family and what I got from my family. So how do I define family? Well, for me, it's about love, it's about belonging, it's about connection. The family, um, they're ideally people that you are safe with, that you learn and grow with. Um, they're the people that encourage you to be your best. It's where you feel fulfilled and connected, ideally a place where you're accepted and loved for who you are. I think that families come in all different shapes and sizes. And what's really important isn't their shape or their size, but that every person in that family is valued and accepted and loved and encouraged. 
So unfortunately, there's a lot of families in New Zealand where the children aren't safe. So I'm talking about domestic violence and child abuse. Um, earlier I spoke a little bit about child poverty. Uh, so 37% of families that are in poverty are estimated to have one parent in work. So I really think in terms of how do we support families, I'm going to run out of time. It's what? It's about income. There's a whole... whole... <laughs> Well done, Sam. You're good. <laughs> uh, kia ora, um, What's important to me in regards to family is whānau. Um, and so within our, we have our immediate family, and within Māori Din we have our extended whānau, and then within that we have our hapu and our iwi. And I think that that's a concept that we can all take on board, because within the family, family necklace you'll have your immediate family, and then you'll have your extended community family, and then, and then you go further out into the community. And, and I'm just hoping that the next uh, government will be able to extend that uh, throughout Aotearoa law, because it really, at the end of the day, um, we have to look after each other. And my husband always says it starts from home. Kia ora. It's really interesting here People say that um, we have dysfunctional families, quote unquote. But I, my concept of a family is my brothers and my sister, two sisters. Uh, my parents died a fairly while ago now. But I also count as my family as my close friends, um, who I can phone or text any time and say, I need some help here, or do you want to go out and do things? Um, so, and I, and I know the United you know, Future thinks the same thing. Um, it's not just about your immediate family, but it's also about those people like the same family that's much wider and um, your, your closest friends as well. Thanks. There's much that I can agree with with what has been said. I was the youngest of five children. I was very fortunate to grow up in a family where my parents loved all their children and taught us boundaries and gave us tremendous opportunities. My wife and I have tried to do the same for our children. I acknowledge my wife down the back who has been the most wonderful mother to our children. And I'm so grateful to her. I'm very, very proud of our children. In fact, I consider them our greatest achievement in life. I recognise that things have changed now, so I think the most important thing is for children to know that they are loved, to know that they are safe, to know that those who are in their family unit, which may not be the traditional structure, much and all, that's my preference and I came in for some grief when I spoke out in favour of the traditional Christian definition of marriage during the same-sex marriage debate. But the most important thing, as I say, is for the children to know that they are both loved and being taught to respect themselves and one another in our community. That way they grow up to be taught to decent citizens. I similarly agree with the traditional concept of family. I was fortunate enough to grow up in a home with a father and a mother. However, unfortunately, at the age of 10, my father passed away from leukemia. So my family went to a single parent home. And so that, in and of itself, changes the concept of family for our family. It, it did low these 25 years. So that is how uh, we need to look and understand things when we consider options of family. How important is family? to a civil society, it's hugely important. Many of the questions I get are is about values, education and school. It used to be that you used to learn those things at home, and that still needs to be the place. Uh, what can our central government do to underpin those values? They can ask you what you think about any changes or liberalisation in policy, whether that's to do with marriage, prostitution reform or drug reform. They should ask you about it. Thank you. So another question uh, from the floor, um, and I, this won't be a surprise to you that there will be this question from a, la a largely uh, Christian audience. Uh, do you personally, so just could you just note this question carefully, do you personally support decriminalisation of abortion and what is your party's viewpoint? So it's asking for a personal response and then your party's viewpoint, and I'm sure that can be said in less than a minute. Who's first? Um, 
my personal uh, uh, response is no. Uh, our party hasn't discussed it as, as such, but if I am to take any um, indication from the approach that we as a party take to things like this, we would uh, refer to a, uh, a binding referendum. I don't personally support any change to the existing abortion laws and I think that every effort should be put into giving as much counselling as possible to those who are considering an abortion to consider an adoption as an alternative option. There are, there's a shortage of children available for adoption and I'd love to see more that can come available. As a party issue, no, this is not something that our caucus ever would take a party position on because abortion has always been a conscience vote and you'll get in all the major parties and probably the minor parties as well a range of issues, uh, sorry, a range of opinions and that should be respected. Thank you. Uh, yes, my view is that I do support the right uh, to abortion for women. It's their body and it's their choice. I know that that's quite a controversial view. But here's the thing about changing the law and legalizing or decriminalizing it. Currently, the practice is essentially that it's legal. If you go to your doctor and you're pregnant, they refer you to the hospital. You don't need any other reason than you do not want the child to have an abortion. So what I think is that our law should reflect our current medical practice. And absolutely, people should be fully informed of all of the options and have, have all of the support and everything like that available to them. I know some women that have chosen to have abortions and it has been a very challenging decision for them to make. It's not something that's made lightly, um, but I guess my argument, I just would put to you that the current practice needs to be reflected in the law. And that's also the party's position. <laughs> Well, um, well, I personally do not uh, support abortions and our party doesn't have a policy on it. Um, so our policies are, are more at tax reform, um, smarter immigration, looking at our justice system, um, resetting democracy. But in regards to abortion, no, I don't support it personally. Kia ora. Okay, so the, the uh, Labour Party doesn't have a policy on it. Um, you probably noticed that our leader Jacinda Ardern said that she supported moving to the Health um, Act rather than Crimes Act. However, she, uh, she said the following day that it'll be a conscience vote for MPs. So if it comes up during my term in Parliament, then my intention is to vote to, re to, uh, to remain the status quo, um, for abortion to remain illegal. Uh, my my mother, when she was 19, pregnant with me, she was offered an abortion back in 1975. The doctor said, you can send you over to Australia, you can have the abortion. Um, fortunately, um, she had a couple of people who said, we'll take the baby, and she carried full term, and here I am today. <laughs> so it's um, certainly very personal. She can have the abortion. Uh, yes, um, look, I agree with where we are at the moment uh, in terms of our abortion laws, but at the same time, I think we need to have a larger discussion around it. As Sam said, I think at the end of the day, it is women's body and we need to um, let them decide. But we definitely need a bigger sort of discussion around it because um, if you do take off, you know, you change the abortion laws and you get more people, you know, freely doing it, then you have, uh, you know, issues around gender-based abortion as well. Which is a concern in a lot of other countries, not in New Zealand, but that is another thing that could come into play. Um, so I think, uh, as a doctor, I would say I'm kind of happy with where we are at the moment, but I would like to see a lot more debate around it before um, it goes through the parliament. Uh, Thank you. And, and I'm, I'm sure it's absolutely no surprise to you that the Christian position is a biblical position, which uh, is that uh, there might be the odd exception where an abortion is necessary, but what we have in New Zealand at the moment, uh, we would regard as uh, just untenable. Um, and uh, it's the taking of life, it's, we have a strong position on the sanctity of life and so for the 20% of New Zealanders approximately that are church going and um, that includes the uh, Catholic community, uh, we would say it's a no-go and we're sad that it is as bad as it is but we're pleased that the figures have come down and that has been very encouraging. Sam, your point is absolutely valid. Uh, I think there needs to be a lot more discussion. I mean, it, it's going on all the time here, it's illegal. It doesn't make any sense, there has to be clarity about that. I want to add to that at all? Because I guess what I just say, I think for absolutely everyone, we probably have a lot of common ground in thinking that 
access to contraception and age-appropriate sex education for our kids is the number one. If we can prevent anyone from being in the situation of having to have an abortion, for, for whatever circumstance that is, then that is the absolute best thing, right? So let's talk about sex education, let's talk about contraception, let's ensure that everyone has access to all of those things that they need, because we see it as a health issue and a public health issue. And I think also in terms of what you're saying about the extent of abortion in New Zealand, one in four women have an abortion. We're not talking about the occasional social pariah or, you know, we're talking about a lot of people that are probably close in our families and I think that if we were able to have a conversation about it where we can put women's health at the centre, we're probably going to have a lot better outcomes. Um, yeah, yes. thank you. Thank well, you. you've got to keep in mind the babies still, too. Um, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, just, we don't want to get stuck here, but Jamie, do you want to have the last word on I, I'll just have 10 seconds. Um, I, I think certainly as a school teacher, I think it's absolutely important um, to, to teach uh, sex education in schools, but having abstinence as an option as well. Because, I mean, when, when, when two people sleep together, you know, the consequence, or, well, it's not negative consequence, but you, you have a baby, and often people want society with no consequences at times. Right, thank you. <laughs> well, there's so much more to talk about. We could have a fantastic discussion, I'm sure, but that is a couple of other very important uh, questions. So we're going back to a prepared question. This is a long one. Um, and we need to just share with you some data that will help uh, undergird this uh, question. So I'm going to read it out. Um, it's up, up on the screen as well. Housing, and it's already been referenced, but uh, housing is a major issue in this year's election, no doubt about it. It's a concerning issue uh, for us here in Hamilton. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights affirms access to adequate housing as a vital human right, whether that is owning or renting. A couple of definitions of affordable housing are A, expending no more than 30% of a household's income on housing costs, and these definitions of course are well known, and B, indexing the purchase price of housing at five times the median income. Here in Hamilton, the median household income is around 83000 which actually surprised me, it's quite high, and the average house sale price over a three month period this year was 540000 dollars, 540,000. That is well more than the index of five times of the household income. So how did we get here? Here's the question. How did we get here? And what are your party's plans to address this? It does almost seem, if I might add, a terminal problem. Um, so uh, anyway, um, is it fixable? How do you plan to fix it? So uh, housing is a big, big issue and it's very close to my heart because uh, when my dad came here in 1996, he was homeless. So he used to sleep in a woman's domain, developed in Southern Mission. Uh, now sort of life's come full circle in a way because I came back from the US two months ago after studying there for two years and it's been really hard for me to get accommodation. So I've been sleeping in a, in a bunk bed, I've been sleeping on the floor at people's house in a sleeping bag uh, and it's just amazingly difficult. And if you talk to all the real estate agents in, uh, in Hamilton, they will tell you that this guy's actually looking for a house to rent, not even to buy. So it is, it is a big problem. Uh, for, for Labour Party, what we want to do is we want to ban foreign speculators from buying our existing houses, to, you know, so, so we can have houses for people who want to live in it, rather than just invest to make money out of it. Uh, we're also taxing property speculators who flick houses within five years, so uh, you know, increase the price line for five years. Uh, and at the end of the day, we want more houses. So that's uh, where the problem is. 100,000 more houses in 10 years uh, will help uh, you know, meet the demand. Um, and, uh, and then also remove negative gear. Remove negative gear. Negative gear. Thanks. Next person. Um, the future supports the idea of rent to, rent to own <coughs> um, as a realistic pathway to home ownership. Um, um, so that's you know, for young families and for first home buyers. Yeah. So the Greens are about homes, not houses. We agree that access to shelter is a universal human right. A safe, warm, dry place to call home contributes to strong communities and happy, healthy children. We got to where we are today through speculative investment in the housing market and we can remedy this by tightening the rules around loss attributed in qualifying companies and introducing a capital gains tax on all but the family home. 
Low wages have also contributed to affordability, increased people's ability to save for a deposit and service a mortgage by increasing the minimum wage to no less than 66% of the average wage. We want to reinstate the universal child benefits and the ability to capitalise on them for home loans or home deposits. Shift the standard tenancy conditions towards secure and predictable tenure arrangements. Create legally binding duty on the state sector to ensure housing needs are met. 10,000 homes over 10 years went to buy. Thank you. Very hard to answer this one in one minute, yeah, but I think you go with it. How did we get here? Well, shortage, so shortage of supply. So we need to do everything we can. And we have been passing legislation to try to free up special housing areas, to create some housing accords and the like. I was very pleased with the new mayor of Hamilton late last year. We managed to bring together the fastest housing accord from initial concept to completion in the history of this country. That is going to make a big difference in Hamilton. I also advocated vigorously for a large share from the housing infrastructure fund that the government put up for rapidly growing areas. We have secured $272 million, which is now going into essential infrastructure to open up the Peacock subdivision that has been on the board now for 30 years. This will bring 8,100 new homes to the south of our city. I'm particularly pleased about that because I've been concerned for the whole time I've been an MP that all of the development and investment seems to be happening out in the northeast. And while that's good for Hamilton, we need balance. And the opening of Peacock will rejuvenate our southern suburbs and include some affordable housing. Yeah, so Tim, uh, how long is that project going to? You're doing well. I think yeah. you, need, you need some air. Yeah, you need a breeze. How long is that project, the Peacock's project? The Peacock development will see 750 homes built almost immediately. And over the next 10 to 15 years, it will roll out to 8,100 new homes. Thank you. Next person. How did it happen? First of all, government sold off the, house, the state housing. Secondly, the, the unfettered uh, level of uh, immigration, that's had an effect on the cost of housing. How would New Zealand uh, first uh, address it? First of all, we'd establish a commercial entity called Kiwi Housing, which would take the responsibility of acquiring land and uh, making it available for uh, uh, housing, uh, and of course we would uh, provide long-term uh, lending uh, facilities. We'd also propose a permanent housing commission to um, moderate and manage the housing market. It is clear that the private market will never cope alone and that the current government's reliance on it has not worked, nor will blaming local government or process changes to the Resource Management Act ever be enough and that we believe that territorial councils have a poor responsibility for social housing. Oh, really? There we go. Okay. So the opportunity... The Opportunities Party wants to close the tax loophole on poverty. Um, we see it as not being a shortage of supplies created through the demand, created through uh, people wanting to buy houses for investment and not for homes. Uh, so our policy is really, uh, our tax policy is keen to close that loophole. Um, we also have a rental policy where we'll be looking at long-term rights for tenants, invest in social housing, so our policy will look at the government holding 70% of that responsibility because they still have a fiduciary responsibility to their community. But we also acknowledge that uh, um, the community itself knows what's good for itself, so we'll be also supporting the community in social housing. We'll be looking at a rental warrant of fitness, and we will be looking at ETS to fund uh, um, insulation and more homes. When we came into office, there were just under 66,000 state houses. We haven't been selling off state houses other than those that are in locations where they are no longer required and they're not economically fit to repair. What we now have 
is a commitment, and we're well on the track to getting to 72,000 social houses, and they are where they are needed. They are going to be well insulated, they're going to be affordable, they're going to be accessible. Most will still be owned by you, the taxpayer, a few will be empowered social agencies providing them. So there is more social housing, not less, as a result of a national government. Thank you. Now, we've got another question from the floor. This is coming uh, from a completely different uh, tab. Um, it's quite a broad question. So we, we need to ask you to just really make one response to this question. The question is, if you are elected, what will you be doing for Hamilton in the next three years? So I'm going to give you just kind of like a few seconds to think about that because we want your top, the, the one thing, the, the best thing, the, the you know that's going to stun us all. <laughs> right, Hamilton? We want to stun. <laughs> so, the, so one thing, if you're going to be elected, um, what are you going to give us, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Who's first? Oh, go for it. I want to get behind the Greater Auckland proposal to have the Metro train service support. That seems to get some support. Here you go. Yeah, we want to um, advocate for Hamilton as the best little city in uh, Aotearoa, and that will include uh, train and joining us into the rail network. And now, excuse me, what do you mean little city? <laughs> <laughs> well, Just for your information. We are the fourth largest city. <laughs> Next, please. <laughs> and to add to that, I think, I think we're going to be the second largest city. Uh, the yeah, we will right, be well, 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 well 30, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're doing it. Um, yeah, uh, look, Alan's the same, it's around mail. And, and you've, you've probably heard um, Labour's proposal um, that, that we're going to get a passenger rail between Auckland, Hamilton, and Tauranga, and we're going to get that going within 12 months with free Wi Fi. People can, um, you know, they can they can commute up to Auckland. Um, they can start working as soon as they get on the train or, or, or watch Netflix or whatever. Anybody else from another party? Yeah. Uh, Kilda. Oh, Kilda. Um, I think what's important is that we have a diverse community. And so we want to show off uh, Hamilton, show off the Waikato. And by doing that, we need to sort out poverty and homelessness. Thank you. Well, there is lots that I've been working on that I can continue. Sure. But if you make me to stick with one, I'll go back to the Peacock subdivision because with 8,100 new homes coming on the stream, what we will also need is the services to support that area, and therefore good education services, good health services, pushing for the southern links, which is the final part of our roading system that is vitally important to ease congestion and ensure the access is there. There's a new bridge coming over the Waikato River as a part of that. So just making sure that that is a really successful project that gives our city the balance that is needed will be a driving force for me. Thank you. Any ideas left? <laughs> okay, so now this will be really important. Cool. A couple of the parties won't even agree on something. Which one are you going to agree with? <laughs> Well, of course, we support rail and the free Wi-Fi. Patrick and I were just discussing free ice creams with the Wi-Fi. Right now. Um, but, the, the, but the primary thing for us is that with growth and with development that comes to make sure that we have our services, whether they be schools, hospitals and medical centres, uh, a resource properly enough to cope with the demand. That's what we can do for Hamilton. Both Shane and I uh, accept that the role of a uh, member of parliament is one, to represent the, uh, the electorate and two, to assist the constituency. Now that is the personal uh, uh, relationship. relationship that we want to establish with the, uh, with the electorate. There you go. Thank you. Well done guys. Doing well. Okay, it's probably time for a wee stretch break um, and uh, a little brain break maybe at the table here. So, so here's the deal. Uh, you're going to just quickly talk to one another for a few moments, stretch and such. And number one, 
as these guys are doing a lousy job, right? And, 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 you know, and number seven, they're just brilliant. I mean, it's just outstanding stuff. So as you talk with one another, score these candidates. One, really bad. Seven, really good. Go ahead, stand up and have a look. We're doing well. Got a, another few important questions here. I'm not going to uh, ask you to respond to my question as who are the who scored one and who scored seven, I'm not going to do that. And you're probably worried about that, weren't you? Yeah, they're, they're, they're the ones in the... They're not going to do that, they're not going to do that. Yeah, hold up a number. Yeah. All right, next question. Is uh, up on the screen, coming up on the screen. There's a quote uh, attributed to former Prime Minister of New Zealand, the late David Long. Uh, in the late 80s, uh, 87 I think he said this, our middle class are too rich to be poor and too poor to be rich. It's one of David Long's outstanding little uh, one-liners. In New Zealand, the rich certainly seem to be getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. While we claim to be an egalitarian society, it increasingly appears that we no longer just have a lower class. It seems now we have an underclass characterised by multi-level expressions of poverty, it's in financial, social, educational, moral, and so on. What is the cause of this, and what can be done about it? I think I, think I can go first, since it's David Longy. Um, sure, <laughs> we'll <observe that. laughs> probably seems appropriate. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I, I think it's important that we are having a discussion at, around poverty, because the, 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 there's no doubt there are a lot of people in our society who are struggling. Um, very difficult to survive on minimum wage. Um, go back between 2006 and 2009, I was on minimum wage while I was studying to be a school teacher, and uh, my wife and I had two children at the time, and it was really tough. I mean, we had a veggie garden, we were careful with our money, and we only just had enough each week basically to get by. And then, but you see, there's a new term which is which has come in the recent years, and that's called the working poor. So these are people who are employed, and, and, and they're working, and they're working a full week, sometimes even two jobs, and they're still struggling um, to get by. No chance of buying a house, um, struggling to even put food on the table. Um, and I think one of the big causes of that um, is, is, is around capital, and it's around housing, housing accessibility and housing affordability. When, when you've got rent taking up most of your income, it's very difficult. Good. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure. This is a really lovely question. I'll try and answer it as quickly as I can before those numbers run out at the top of um, As I said earlier, I've been struggling with an illness. Um, I suffer from chronic fatigue syndrome, and I'm on the end of it's been a bit. Um, and I know how difficult it is to try and balance the groceries every week, pay the bills, buy clothes, and you know, just to go online and buy some box to read. Um, how did we get here? I think for the last maybe 50 years, we've spent a lot of time building up um, what I call wealth generating without the social conscience. And uh, now United Future is starting to look into this whole area of social conscience. We've made our wealth, but now we've got to start having a social conscience. And that's why the three things that we have this year is inclusion, equality, and affordability right on the top of the list to make sure that the place are priority. Good job, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah you jump. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to jump straight on into what can we do about it, because I always run out of time to tell you about our specific policy points. Um, so for the working poor, the Green Party had committed to increasing the minimum wage to 17.75, and then continuing to progressively increase it so we can peg the minimum wage at 66% of the median wage. And that's to ensure that the situation like Jamie spoke about, we aren't having a group of people who are getting incredibly far behind. Now, for those who are not in work, the Green Party proposed to increase all benefits by 20%. The reason for this is because welfare, the amount that is paid on welfare currently is not enough to live on. And unfortunately, our welfare system, which when it started was visionary and bold, has become a poverty trap. 
I have 19 seconds left. So I think that a really important thing to note is to first surrender our negative preconceptions and attitudes towards people on welfare and what we think of them, and instead to ask ourselves, what is going to be effective in ending poverty? What is the purpose of our welfare system, and how can we make it work better to lift people out of poverty in the group? Very good. Next person. It is incredibly tough surviving on a benefit. And the best way out of uh, deprivation and poverty is a job. No question of that. And that's what families need, particularly the children. Our government has raised the minimum wage every year in the nine years we've been in office. 50 cents an hour this year, and we will continue to do that if we remain in government. Last year, we had the first significant increase in benefits of any government since Norman Kirk's, and that was our government, we did that. On this year's budget, we introduced a $2 billion family incomes package, which we've legislated for, and I hope will remain in place. I want to thank the Greens for supporting that. That will see a very large number of families next year off, better off by $25 a week. We've also led, legislated to increase working for families and the housing supplement. So we're doing a whole lot of things financially for those at the bottom end. But part of the problem is the fact that deprivation is often not an economic thing, it's a social thing. And if you have children who are growing up in homes where they are not being well fed, not being given the sort of opportunity to get to school and all of those other things that are so important, and then they will never get out of that position. <laughs> Next. Uh, so to the, uh, to the question about what is the cause of this, uh, the decline of productivity and prosperity. That is what the cause of a lower class and underclass, uh, that is the driver behind that. Um, and so how do we respond to that? What can we do is to make sure that work always pays more than welfare. Uh, which is why New Zealand first has announced uh, increasing the minimum wage uh, to $20 over three years um, to encourage that uh, prosperity. Uh, the other part that we would like to do is to make sure when we talk about employment and unemployment that we look at what Statistics New Zealand called underutilisation. That is the number of people who are working 20 hours a week or less and want to work more. So there is that decline in productivity uh, that we need to respond to. <laughs> I think that's very good. Really great. Just to say that uh, we are getting quite a lot of questions. Uh, we're trying to, uh, in terms of the questions from the audience, to keep those uh, in the more policy area rather than quite a lot of your questions are very specific and We'll, we will come to those if we have time, but we're trying to keep questions to the more substantial policy arena. So if you've got questions in that space, then uh, please uh, would you uh, send them on down. All right, we're going to go to our next question, which is question five. Uh, the Vulnerable Children's Act 2014 sets out a definition of vulnerable children as children who are at significant risk of harm to their well-being now and into the future as a consequence of the environment in which they are being raised and in some cases due to their own complex needs. Not having their basic emotional, physical, social, developmental and or cultural needs met at home or in the wider community. How serious is this a priority issue for your party and what are your plans to address it? Vulnerable children. Well, this is a very serious uh, um, situation, and I, I take the point in regards to uh, children in their present situation. Now, history will show that there are children who have been taken from their families and put into state care, and whose care has been worse than the situations that they've come from. And so, New Zealand First supports the idea of a general inquiry into the care of state wards as a start to addressing this problem. Okay, thank you. Well, it's just about the top priority for our government. After all, we were the ones who passed the bill and we were the ones who put that definition into it. We've introduced the Vulnerable Children Orangi Tamariki 
ministry specifically to focus on the needs of children who are at most disadvantaged and who are vulnerable for the reasons that many of us have already canvassed. I've been a big supporter of Whānau Ora because I believe that families need wraparound services rather than a whole lot of individual services with the cars parked up the driveway. Whānau Ora is a much more holistic approach that tries to identify where there is a range of needs because it's very rare for one to come in isolation. We have the social investment strategy, which Bill English has pioneered, and it means that in many respects dealing one-on-one -on -one with individual children and individual families and trying to ensure that we are really targeting those areas of need. It's something that drives me, it continues to make me want to seek your support because I can't think of much that is more distressing than seeing a child who is alienated and just in danger of becoming another casualty of a statistic. We must do better for them. Always consider it, and always sit down and discuss it, and provide different ways of implementing it. But so long as it, 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 it meets the future generations, that is, well, it's meet our 20 year impact test. Is the policy going to last beyond 20 years? Thank you. Uh, so we agree with the uh, Long Island Children's Act of 2014, which was um, passed by the National Government, uh, but there is a lot more that it can do further. So for example, it doesn't provide uh, protection from third party uh, people who are involved in, uh, in working with kids. Uh, the other thing is Jacinda Ardern's talked a lot of times about um, state apology uh, and to previous abuses of uh, children. Uh, and then the third thing is the Human Rights Commission itself and uh, Judge Collingwood's um, inquiry said that we should go into a further Royal Commission uh, I'm further deep inquiry into what has happened in the past, uh, and that's been our position for a long time. Just have talked about it a lot, many times, uh, and I think the state should apologise for people who have suffered uh, under care. Um, yeah. Thank you. Sorry, it's just writing some more notes. I feel very strongly about this, and I actually work for the children's teams uh, in Hamilton. So first, I would like to say that this is a significant priority for the Green Party, and as we all know, well-supported kids turn into happy, healthy adults. Um, I, would, I would like to add that um, this is probably the first time you'll hear me say that the National Party haven't underfunded the children's teams. And that's because they haven't funded the children's team. They are unfunded. All of the work that happens is essentially volunteers um, my organisation pay me, for example, and they volunteer my time to the children's teams. If we're seriously saying that children are our priority, and they absolutely need to be, where is the funding for already stretched social services to ensure that we're meeting the needs of our most vulnerable children? <laughs> so there is a significant gap that I'd also like to address, and that is if a child's case doesn't meet the level of Orang and Tamariki, and the parents don't consent to the voluntary children's team, there is nothing in the middle to support or engage with those families, and that leaves some of our most vulnerable kids at risk. Um, this is really uh, close to my heart, um, as I have a legal background, and um, my specialty was RMA, but I find myself being an advocate um, so if we have dysfunctional uh, families who aren't getting access to the right health care, uh, to their right uh, entitlements if they're on benefits and not getting access to jobs, then that uh, leaves our children really, really vulnerable and puts the family under a lot of pressure. Um, and the Opportunity Party uh, acknowledges this and truly believe that it's up to the community, and like I said earlier, the extended farmer and the community, uh, to take care of those children. Uh, we totally support the farmer and water concept, but we also want to um, actually give, give uh, local communities uh, the power to actually help themselves. And that goes with funding, because you can't just talk about it, you've actually got to show it through resourcing. Got it. Let's move right on to, uh, so could we just put up question seven rather than question six? I'd like to uh, come back to question six. There we go. So New Zealand's population is ageing uh, as baby boomers approach retirement. You're looking at 
and research around the world suggests that it is simply becoming unaffordable to sustain. What is your party's policy on superannuation, its affordability and a society's responsibility to care for its elderly? That's not me. Quentin, can you, can you ask to just put a mic closer? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, United Future has what we call a flexi super, which means you can choose when you retire with flexible superannuation, either at a reduced rate from 60 or deferred until 70 to receive an increased rate. Um, this gives people a chance to retire early if they want to, like me. So currently at the moment we have, um, with our superannuation, the unconditional uh, uh, universal basic income, so everybody gets it. Um, and Gareth said, well, why should he, as a multi-millionaire, um, be entitled to superannuation? Because all he's going to do is go and buy another motorbike. And all his rich mates are just going to go have another holiday in the Pacific. So he, so he says that, well, actually he wants to give some of that back, and we should be really supporting the youth and supporting those young families, as I mentioned earlier. So, so what that means is that the superannuation will be means tested, and those superannuitants that are currently entitled, uh, will, who will be entitled to get superannuation will probably end up with more money in their pocket than they get now. Kia ora. Okay, right, so the, the Labour Party policy is, is to keep it universal. We believe if you've spent most of your life paying taxes, then when you get to 65, um, that you're entitled to a pension. Um, so the age will remain at 65. Um, there are a lot of people who have worked in very physical jobs. By the time they get to 60, 61, their, their body's really struggling. Um, and by the end of 65, they, they just literally can't work anymore. So we keep it 65, the way we're going to pay for it is through the superannuation fund, which was started under the last Labour government, commonly called the Cullen Fund. It's now got $35 billion in it, and, um, and, and it, it, it returns the return investments of at least 10% right through the GFC. And one other thing we're going to do is we're going to bring in a winter payment um, for those on a pension, uh, and that's um, $400.50 per person during the six months of winter and 700 per couple. Unfortunately, we can't do anything about the rain, though. But we'll help with the cold. We believe our society has a responsibility to ensure that people are cared for have shelter and sufficient income to participate in their communities. For that reason, we support um, New Zealand superannuation for all New Zealanders 65 years and older, adjusted annually in accordance with movement to the CPI. We believe that universality makes a significant contribution to independence, respect, dignity and well-being for people. We acknowledge that many low-wage earners and people who spend their working lives in labouring working bodies which suffer the long-term effects of this, and in turn makes continued work challenging and detrimental to their health. Increasingly, work is precarious and many people work in an insecure environment. The likelihood of working full-time prior to retirement is declining every day. We especially want to acknowledge the kind of work that includes caregiving, farm labouring, trade labour such as brickies and carpenters, and also the health challenges for truck drivers. Thank you. Uh, no, you don't need to. Okay. Um, we will keep it universal and pay to 66% of the average wage. We have in our time in office raised it by 36%. Uh, since 2008. There's a certain irony here that I should be reading out the Labour Party's policy from the last election and the Labour Party should be reading ours. We have now decided, as you would have heard, that we are going to raise the age of eligibility in 20 years' time to 67. The reason is we are an ageing population, there are more people living longer, those who are affected by that, and so anybody who's within 20 years of uh, reaching the current retirement age will not be affected, but those who are will be living longer and will be receiving super for a longer period of time of their lives than people are getting it now. It's a way of ensuring that we keep it sustainable long term because it's a very, it's a very important but also very expensive part of government expenditure. <coughs> I don't think that there's anyone in this room who has any doubt about New Zealand First's commitment to, to the superannuants. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and so we will remain at, uh, at 65. And isn't it funny that people are saying that in a few years' time we're not going to be able to sustain it because of the cost, and yet at the same time tell us how good our economy is and how, how it's growing. Now for Shane and I, we enjoy a quality of life on the backs of those of you who have already retired and the taxes that you pay. So both he and I feel that we have an obligation to ensure that we make our contribution to the next uh, generation. So New Zealand First is very, is very clear. We support uh, uh, the retention of superannuation at the same age. And if you remember, those of you who will have a gold card in your pocket will <laughs> qualify at the, at the moment. Help is on its way. We're going to
It was just another question from the floor. Uh, which one policy does your party have that will most positively impact Māori? Yep, sure. Which one policy does your party have that will most positively impact Māori? Maybe I understand you need to ponder, maybe, and by all means, have a chat amongst yourselves. You ready to go? Yep. We don't have a, one, one specific policy that impacts on Māori. All our policies in, impact on not only Māori, but all New Zealanders. And that's why our name, New Zealand First. Okay, thanks. All Green Party policy is looked at through the lens of Tatility or Waitangi. We envision a nation where Tatility or Waitangi is accepted and celebrated as a founding document of Aotearoa New Zealand. The status of Māori as tangata whenua is recognised and respected, and the many dynamic aspects of Māori life and culture enhanced to benefit us all. We seek a future where tikanga is respected and enabled, where racism is eliminated, and where the physical, mental, emotional and spiritual effects of colonisation on our people are healed to create a healthy society where everyone thrives. Yeah. Uh, so we've already spoken about our tax reforms, our smart immigration policy and our unconditional base income. But I think one really important policy that we have that will benefit Māori but benefit the rest of the community as well as our democracy reset. We will establish a constitution and a constitutional authority. There will be civics and te reo education, protect public interests, journalism, honour the treaty and all individual rights spread through the constitution and the empowerment of our local communities and our people as a whole. Kia ora. Income sharing policy, which um, means that couples with children will be able to com combine their income for tax purposes. Um, unfortunately, Māori are overrepresented in our prison population, um, and it's a key. This is a key area that we need to address. And, 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 and in our opinion, one of the key drivers to success is around education. So we've got some, uh, we've got a policy around three years free tertiary study over a person's lifetime. So if you've never done any study before, then you'll be eligible for three years free tertiary study, whether that's university, whether it's wood tech, whether it's a trade, um, or, and, or whether it's an apprenticeship. And we're gonna bring back, um, a bit, we're gonna bring more apprenticeships in and we're going to supervise the, the um, goal for apprenticeships as well. Yeah, so particularly around education. Um, education creates opportunity, and that's key. The, the, I believe it's the key way to lift someone out of a difficult financial situation is education. Yeah, so that's good. So that, that'll segue well into the next question, which... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm, that's I'm, right. I'm, I'm jumping out. Go ahead. It's incredibly difficult to pick out one thing, but I, if I have to pick out one, then I'm going to say raising Maori rates of engagement in education at the very earliest age, and we've been firmly focused on ensuring that we get as many young Maori and Pacific, and in fact all New Zealanders, into early childhood education, having better levels of achievement in school and getting up to 85% through NCEA level two, because that in the modern economy is really the benchmark for being able to cope in the modern economy where jobs are becoming much more technologically focused. So there's a lot that I could talk about, but I think raising engagement and achievement for Murray in education is a big part of helping them to get ahead. So, uh, it's already been touched on, but let's uh, answer this question from the floor. What is your party's view uh, excuse me, around tertiary education and the cost of it? <laughs> so, uh, well, our one's quick, we... Sorry, our one's quick, we already said it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I mean like, we, we think it needs to be accessible. If you go back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, tertiary education was free. Um, I, I realise the government do subsidise around 80% already. Um, but um, I just paid off a loan of 35000 um last year, which was nice. 
Uh, but yeah, look, I mean, I mean, that was about a hundred dollars a week going out, you know, out of our pay packet. <coughs> so, so basically, just to reiterate, that's three years of free tertiary study. We're going to stagger it in. So, um, from next year, 2018, um, people will have one year for free, um, two years from 2021, and then three years from 2024. And we and we're going to fund it through um, reversing the um, family. Um, Family incomes package that national proposing, so you know, there's, there's a choice there for people. So, so I just want to have something to add. So, Very good. Um, apart from the, the three years of uh, free education, if uh, you know, there are kids who don't want to go to university, they have some bright ideas about starting a startup. Uh, we will send them to a target university where we'll be setting up a big hub uh, so you can take out three years worth of uh, money and set up your own uh, company, and we will help you uh, build that company as well so you can. Uh, get more jobs for more people because we realise not everybody wants to go to university and have a have a degree. Uh, so that's another thing, very important thing, especially in today's age where people are making money out of startups rather than doing six years of business school. Kia ora. Well, I hold a masters in law, and I think my student debt was about fifty thousand plus. And I must say, I've nearly paid that off. But anyway, <laughs> oh, I wish I hung around until they'd have brought their policy out. Um, <laughs> Timely. Yeah, um, what the Opportunity Party wants to do is look at a tertiary sector review to ensure lifelong learning. And also, what we want to do is, um, uh, in regards to our uh, justice system and those that are in prison, to give prisoners more opportunity towards education as well. Sure. We carry on down the line. Um, so for the Green Party, we really value education. We think that it is a public good and it needs to be invested in accordingly. Um, so what the Green Party wants to do is cap and pro progressively reduce student fees. We would instead fund directly the institutions that provide the education because they're much more effective at using that. Um, in terms of student poverty, we would increase the student allowance to enable students to be able to study and eat, uh, which unfortunately is not the case for a lot of tertiary students. Um, and we also have a, um, a plan to, for every year of tertiary study um, that accrues debt, if you then work and volunteer in your community and return your skills and your knowledge to New Zealanders and to New Zealand communities, we would wipe every year of a year of debt for every year Work in your communities. Sorry, I kind of bungled that. Right. My text. Um, we'd also restore funding for postgraduate education because we need to be a high skilled economy. Um, and if we're not funding postgraduate education, I'm not sure how we're really expecting to get there. Um, and we would restore the training incentive allowance. Thank you. Very good. Everybody, Shane, go ahead. Uh, New Zealand First treats tertiary education, whether that's at a university, a polytech, a wanganga or a PTE, as an investment in the future. Uh, which is why we link our policy towards um, making sure that is as accessible as possible. Uh, so we are looking at introducing a universal student allowance. Uh, we also will have a, pol we have a policy sorry, uh, on bonding people who work here in New Zealand after study. So one year's work equals one year's uh, reduce from the student debt. Because of course it's an investment. We are paying up front for future working productive New Zealanders. So if we treat it like an investment, the return is they work here in New Zealand, they pay back that investment. That's New Zealand first. Right. Both of our children have university qualifications, very proud of them. They're they're now in good jobs and they're both, along with most people, but young New Zealanders paying off fairly sizable student loans. We kept the previous government's interest-free student loans policy. We are, as a government, spending more on education than ever before. $11.6 billion per annum goes into education each year. So it's a very sizable investment and you're the taxpayers paying for it. You are, as taxpayers, paying for 75 to 80% of every university student's course costs. And it's not unreasonable to expect them, therefore, to make a contribution. That means many of them getting jobs either while they're studying or during university holidays and that sort of thing, and allowing for the fact that they will, in the main, go on to pretty good incomes in years to come. I personally would prefer to see even more emphasis being given into those who want to go into trades and apprentices, because apprenticeships, because that's where the jobs are in the future. 
And while I would never wish to demean any university course, all learning is valuable, it's also important that we put the right incentives in place for people to go into the training where the jobs are in the future. Very good, thank you. Uh, we're going to go back to question six, one of the, the um, uh, prepared questions. Uh, so we're going to, it's kind of changing the tack a little bit, um, but we're coming towards the end of the evening. Uh, so um, it's a kind of personal question, reflecting on that personally on why you're doing what you're doing. So the question is, why are you standing for Parliament? What do you, what do you personally hope to achieve? Why are you standing for Parliament? Or we stand? <laughs> and what do you personally hope to achieve? For me, my specialty is um, foreign policy, national security and intelligence. One of the things that's really concerned me in the last few months is a um, whole um, confrontation with North Korea and the Americans. Um, this has been a passion of mine to be able to understand why is this happening in our back door. Um, it's one of the reasons why I want to get into Parliament because I'm passionate about trying to solve problems that will affect our security here in terms of our friendships with those in the, in the South Pacific and Asia countries. Um, we've built up relationships with China, Vietnam, uh, Japan, Brunei, um, and other countries. Um, it's a big long list. Um, but We've got to keep those relationships going so that our economy can keep growing. So that's one of the reasons why I want to get into Parliament. Thank you. I thought, I thought we all had the reason, the same reason to get into uh, to politics, so we could spend time with Tim. Uh, <laughs> I didn't realise there were different reasons. Uh, oh, well, yeah, so that a beautiful. Uh, but actually, I'm actually going to use a little bit of my time to talk about, we talked about one of the issues that could help improve uh, Māori. And actually, the thing that I think will do that is a serious discussion about the future of the Māori seats. Um, we had two uh, Māori seat team uh, candidates who are supposed to be with us here tonight. They're having a debate on the other side of the city. How can we discuss about what the future of New Zealand looks like when we're having a discussion here and there's another discussion happening on the other side of town? Actually, if we want to improve Māori welfare and development, we need to have those discussions in rooms like these uh, and not in other rooms elsewhere. So that's why I'm here. Well, um, look, first of all, I want to talk about the live labour and then I want to talk about live farming. Um, so as I said before, you know, uh, my dad came here as an immigrant. I'm an immigrant myself. I came here when I was 12. Uh, my dad was homeless. Uh, we've been through a lot of different things. Um, but what helped me was New Zealand. You know, people in New Zealand who gave me hope, who gave me education, and uh, who gave me a place to call home. Um, I went to good school. I went to open grammar. I got a good education. I went to medical school. I got a Fulbright scholarship. Went to the US and studied there. And when I was sitting there, um, the Republicans uh, that I'm black from Tennessee asked me uh, to help write the repeal to Obamacare. Uh, and the reason to write the repeal to Obamacare wasn't because they wanted to write something better, it's just that they wanted something to uh, ruin President Obama's legacy. Anyway, when I was sitting there, I was thinking, you know, I could either sit here and write all this crap for uh, the Republicans and Donald Trump, or I could go back home and use all the knowledge that I've gained from all around the world and help, um, you know, people in New Zealand who have helped me. Um, so I decided to come back and I came and uh, worked on Lucinda's bi-election campaign before she was a different leader. Uh, and from there on, you know, she pushed me. Is this, is this individual? It actually, yeah, it should be. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so the, the, the um, key for me, um, the big catalyst for me was when we had our first child, uh, which was 2007. Seems like a long time ago. Um, so my wife and I have four children, aged between four and nine, two boys, two girls. And, and, and for me, my, my driver is their future. And um, I, I want to make sure that they've got a, there's a good public health system for them. If they get sick, that 
they know they can go to hospital and be, be looked after, um, that they can afford to buy a house, that there's a good education system, um, that, that their communities are safe. And then the, the other part is particularly around education, um, being a school teacher, obviously I'm really passionate about that. It's important that we have a diverse curriculum. Um, I'm, I'm a music teacher and uh, yeah, well, I won't go into that one. No, yeah, yeah, so I'm a music teacher, and, and, and there's, there's some key aspects that, that happen in the arts, the confidence, creativity, cooperation. You know, so diverse curriculum is absolutely important. Yeah. Um, well, I have uh, five adult children who are now starting the next generation, and my driver actually has been my mukupuna. So I want my mukupuna to grow up in, in, in a world that I grew up in as a child, um, where we did take care of each other, where we did take care of communities, where we shared our clay and shared our food with our neighbours. So I want my mukupuna to be able to achieve that, and that's my driving force for getting into Parliament. I want them to be able to benefit, and, and I worry about their future in regards to the degradation of our environment. And again, that's my driver. Kia ora. So I was inspired to stand for Parliament by a man drying bricks in the sun in an isolated rural village in Myanmar. It was after their first election in 50 years. Uh, the National League for Democracy won. And this man said to me that he is the only person in his village who can read and write. So he told me that he has a real sense of obligation and duty to ensure that other people can be informed about what's happening in the world, what's happening in their country, and what they can do to make their lives better. That really challenged me to think about what's my responsibility to my communities and what's my duty to the future of New Zealanders. So that day, I came away from that village feeling really, really sad. I mean, I wasn't sad for the little village children there. I was feeling really sad for the children in Hamilton that I've been working with for the past three years because their lives are characterised by violence, gangs, drugs, poverty, lack of education. They don't have a sense of hope, and I really think that has to change. So, oh, I know nearly 20 years ago, I walked into a, a room at the University of Waikato that was full of dreadlocked hippies. Um, and I found my tribe. I found, <laughs> it was great. Um, so, for me, the reason that I want to do this is for fairness, dignity, and respect for all. Also, um, justice and freedom from injustice. Um, it means a lot to me to represent and be a, an unemployment advocate or a beneficiary advocate and to advocate for people in the community who have nothing and to try and get them at least eating and in shelter. I want to change that because we shouldn't have people out there doing that every day. Also, the other part of that justice and freedom from injustice that's important to me is justice for our environment, Justice for Tangata Whenua, Tangata Tiriti, and how we work in genuine partnership to transform Aotearoa. Kia ora. Okay. New Zealand is doing well, Hamilton is booming, but I want to keep supporting policies that will ensure that those who are not enjoying that success yet can get there, because lifting those up at the bottom is what drives me on. Having been an MP for nine years, I can tell you that while there are a whole lot of things I've been really um, privileged to be a part of and feel very proud of to have supported in Parliament, the things that probably give me the greatest pleasure are working for individual constituents here in Hamilton West, and so some of the achievements are things I could never tell you about because they're personal problems that people have been, in many cases, really distressed with. I have sat in my office sometimes and wept with people because it seems that life has dealt them such a cruel blow. And being in a position to help them, I can't wave a magic wand and save all, solve all their problems, but whenever I can help them, that gives me enormous pleasure. So I want to continue working for a, child, a country that your children, my children, and our grandchildren will feel it giving them great opportunities to go and make an even greater contribution. Yeah, for, for me, I just want to say that politics as a vocation can be nasty, 
and can be cruel. But in spite of that, it is the only vocation that I know of that changes can be made in the shortest possible time. And I uh, want to be part of a government that will make those, those changes. Because when you're in opposition, you, you can't uh, do that. And my involvement in, in politics is only as a result of my loyalty to a fellow tribesman who happens to be my, my leader. And if you remember the tight fire and the breakdown of the New Zealand First uh, Team, that was led by a close relative of mine. And so my tribe uh, gave me the, uh, the responsibility of trying to uh, repay that, that debt, so to speak. So if you consider if we were still going, we'd be a, a major part. All right, so look, we're um, at the end of our evening now, except for your closing uh, one minute speeches. But before we do, I'm going to come to one question that has come through very strongly from the floor that we haven't touched on. And I'm going to ask you just, to, just for a 30 second response. So um, I'll count, you know, one, two, three, I'm not going to be able to do this. But, um, it is about climate change, and we know that that is a, a big issue. I know uh, the Greens are now very happy uh, that this question is coming away. But here it is. Uh, what uh, will your party do to help New Zealand meet its climate change targets by reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, so, uh, very quickly, please. Um, so, we will be... The Opportunity Party wants to be fossil fuel free by 2050. Reforest erosion prone land of 1.0 million hectares, uh, invest in electric cars and trains, sustainable land use, and remove fossil fuel subsidies for oil exploration. Kia ora. Thank you. Great expression. Sam, I guess it's you. You're just dying to say something. Like, we would like to go last, actually. Would well, you? Okay. I really I want to go last. Who's going to do it for Labour? Yeah. So um, the Labour's view, I think, is quite similar to the Greens. <laughs> Not as there, but um, uh, to be net, uh, have net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. So this was this was released uh, yeah. a couple of days ago. I think the key thing around climate change is we need to be aspirational um, rather than be sort of a fast follower of the rest of the world. Um, we can be a leader for the world. Um, over in Norway, they've already got 50% electric cars. We're small enough and mobile enough to take a lead in this area. Next. Yep. Just moving this way. Yep. Um, okay, John. Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, Quentin, would you like to? So, it's about greenhouse. Uh, so, okay. What will your party do to help New Zealand meet its climate change targets by reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, okay. 30 seconds. Um, by giving people $5,000 to change to electric cars, build more charging stations, and have a target of zero, carbon zero, by 2050. Okay. Right, well, we set the target. We have an ETS that we're committed to maintaining. Uh, we are funding significant research which will be of international consequence because one of the unusual things about New Zealand's climate change um, picture is that obviously a lot of it comes from the agricultural sector and we will not kneecap the backbone of our economy, which is our primary production, by bringing our primary producers in and putting them at a competitive disadvantage with other primary producers around the world. What we are doing is funding research into reducing the emissions through better pastures so that effectively the cows when they do their business. Um, producing so many emissions, we have also committed to a target of doubling electric vehicles every year, and we're at it. Thank you. New Zealand first approach is to the electrification of, of public transport and eventually uh, all, all transport. But we question our uh, obligation to the Paris Accord. And we think that the one point odd billion dollars that is required to pay towards that afford should 
would be better utilized with our own research and, and development. Particularly when you consider that the largest economy is not even subscribed to that accord. Okay, and your turn. Um, so I'm quickly going to tell you the ways that we're going to respond to this. Firstly, we've announced today that we're going to plant 1.8 billion trees in cities, towns and regions, and this will generate 100,000 jobs. No more deep sea oil drilling, no new coal mines. We need a tax on carbon. The Green Party support the Zero Carbon Act, and we need New Zealand to be a zero carbon economy by 2050. We want 100% renewable energy by 2030, and we have a $100 million green infrastructure fund to support transitioning to better public transport systems. Um, a $210 million sustainable farming partnership fund, and we also have um, a green in investment bank, which means that we can take advantages of uh, opportunities for renewable energy. I am going to keep So good. How was that for a setup? All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to once again. This, this is going to be out of the hat. Okay. So are you ready? It's one minute. Are you ready? I'm going to pick it out of here. I'm just going to do a little bit of shuffle here. I'm just seeing if I can pick up a vibe. <laughs> it's the greens. <laughs> Change. <laughs> um, it's, this is Touché. really important. I really want to address this. And it's to say, no matter what the government say about what targets they've set on climate change, the ultimate test is what's happened with our emissions. And our carbon emissions have increased. That is really significant. Um, so we would have a legally binding uh, target for climate emission reductions. So the Green Party, we love New Zealand, um, and what we want is clean water. We want rivers that you can swim in and drinking water that you can trust. We want to end poverty and we will increase people's income to ensure that every child has the best start possible and that we have the fairest life for everyone in New Zealand. In terms of climate action, we also want a clean economy that cuts pollution and creates well-paid jobs. We think there are huge, amazing, wonderful opportunities to be taken advantage of. We just need a bold government that's committed to doing it. Quentin, it's you, my friend. Hold up the mic. I'm choked. Yeah. <laughs> um, United Future has a lot of new policies that have been brought out, but there is one particular one that I would like to, to um, bring up that has been the talk of the town since um, the year DOS. And I particularly noticed it this morning on the Q&A show, and it was about the, the fresh water problem. What I was proposing to do, <coughs> and I'm sure that the United Future agrees, as it has and on a lot of these issues, is what we need to do is have a framework that has um, around fresh water that looks at the whole thing of extraction of water and how it's allocated and how to preserve our rivers 
uh, for swimming, fishing, and drinking. Those are three things that can be done in, inside one policy. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, so look, this election is not about personalities. You know, we everybody, everywhere I go. Oh, oh excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> so everywhere I go, you know, people say Tim is a nice guy. Right? A Quinton is a nice guy, and everyone here sitting here is a nice guy and a nice, nice lady. But this election is about vision. You know, we've come to a point where our families are struggling, our kids are struggling, hospitals are struggling. You know, you've got people lying there in ambulances who can't get into a GP practice for two weeks. Um, you've got kids who are you know, committing crime because they don't have hope. And if they're not committing crime, they're committing suicide. And the only solution to this is to go with a government that has the vision for everyone, for kids, for adults, uh, for all the people. Uh, and as I said, this is not about you know, one, one party or one, one person. This is about the future of New Zealand. And it's about time that you, know, you give a deep thought to this. We've got two weeks to change the government and you know, bring New Zealand to the forefront, um, which we've been like for a long time. Thank you. <laughs> For the last nine years, I've represented the best electorate in the country, and I am asking you to enable me to continue serving the people of Hamilton to the very best of my ability, and I pledge to do that. In his absence, could I also ask you to support David Bennett? I have worked very closely with David. We have advocated strongly for Hamilton, and I believe that we have produced a number of really important results. I've seen how hard David works, and he needs your support as well. But the most important thing for you to remember is that it is the party vote that determines the shape of the parliament. So could I please ask you to give your party vote to National to ensure that we are in a position to lead the next government? Because all the important social indicators in health and education and law and order are moving in the right direction. We have better education results. We have more health services at Waikato Hospital. We have 101 more police coming to the Waikato region. We have policies to try to deal with the most vulnerable, most alienated. I believe that with the national government, you are getting good results, spending your money wisely. To Good evening, everybody. The first thing I want to say is that Peter and I will be available for selfies after this in the lobby. <laughs> this is a social media generation, ladies and gentlemen, so let's get that right. <laughs> oh, shall we? Stop the clock. <laughs> the other thing I want to say, ladies and gentlemen, is you might have come along here tonight already have decided who you'll be voting for. You may have become a little bit more confused as you've heard us speak, and you may uh, still be unaware. If there is ever a moment of indecision that you have, whether you are on this side, in the middle, or over there, just think of there is but one party that is committed to putting you, your country, and New Zealand first, and that is here in New Zealand first. So, unlike Tim, we won't be greedy. We'll ask for one vote, and that is your party vote, New Zealand first. Thank you very much, everyone. We put our hand on heart, we know that our environment is impoverished. If you want radical change, then I, I believe you need to vote for the Opportunities Party. Our tax reform is our flagship. Our, our smarter immigration will see more employment for Kiwis. Our um, unconditional base income will give us all a hand up eventually, but to start off with, we'll be giving the youth and young families a hand up. So guys, you know, put your hand on heart if you want radical change, if you want to um, not see any more homelessness, if you want to create an environment that we're going to be proud of, please vote the Opportunities Party. Kia ora. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, just express, uh, which I just want to, on behalf of us all, to thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for sticking to the rules and thank you for clear and, and, and well-spoken statements. Uh, I, I think it's been very helpful, very important.
thank you to all of you. Thanks for the questions. Sorry we didn't answer all of them, but thank you for coming. This has been a good crowd, according to our, our folks here. And so just before, just please don't be just right now, because Brian's just going to uh, close our meeting here tonight. And Brian, again, thank you so much for hosting a fantastic night. I'm pretty sure you can't hear me very well. chat with him on their behalf. <laughs> Father in heaven, we believe that you want the best for Aotearoa New Zealand. And so we ask a really big prayer now. Would you watch over this election process the next two weeks? Would you, Lord, help us as a nation to, to not just be naive, populist influence, uh, but to be thinkers, to be people that weigh up our convictions, our ideas, and to take seriously this process. Would you help every citizen of this land who is eligible to vote, would you guide them in this process? For the concept of government, we believe, Father, is something that you have put in place. And we honour that and we take it seriously. And we honour these people here tonight who have dared to stick their heads up above the parapet. And before you, Lord, we honour them. We pray that you bless them. Amen. That their service and their desire to serve us as their constituency will be something that brings great encouragement to them. So bless them and their whanau, their families, their households, we pray. But Lord, we submit ourselves to you and thank you for the freedom that we enjoy in this land, which is not the privilege in many parts of the world, to have a say. We simply pray that we would do that well. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And the cafe is open. God bless you.